your life. Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, Rajiv ji with us. Uh, and this time we are totally different. Every time, basically, we chat and try to answer the question, but this time, you guys can call us directly. I'll explain how, but for now, Rajiv ji, welcome. How's things? Two weeks. Anything new? Nothing. Immigration reform uh, through a reconciliation bill is still stuck. The reconciliation bill is still stuck. So we don't know what's going to happen. We'll see, but in the meantime, life chugs on. The good news is that beginning November first week, we will not have a travel ban. We will just have your vaccination check. So that is good news for a lot of people. I'm hearing that the Indian consulates are getting back into full swing. So I don't know about the rest of the world yet. Various places are reporting various things. Right. So check on your local consulates and their workloads. But I expect things will start getting normal in a few months, not right away, because they do have a backlog there at top. Hmm. And also I heard um, the US, I mean, the tourist visas are now back in, after like November 8. Well, the, see, there are two aspects to it. One is the consulate's availability. Are they working? And the other one is the legal impediment. So the legal impediment is being removed, but are they working? See, what they are doing is they are going to front load first the student visa and the applications for immediate relatives, as well as things like K1, K3, et cetera, fiance visas. So therefore it is not enough for the travel ban to be removed for tourist visas to be considered an easy get because we also have to worry about what the workload of the consulates is. Yeah. Yeah. Guessing they're gonna focus on student and H1 first. It's, it's... Well, they are doing students and immediate relatives first. So I don't know, uh, somewhere in there, I think I would suspect that they should, they should put in the H1Bs also, L1s, H1Bs, employment-based reasons. We'll, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Right. Okay, so for those of you who are joined, we have about 100 people live. So um, the way this is gonna work is uh, I'll post a number and uh, you can call to that number. It's a, uh, well, you'll have to say your name, etc. But just call to that number and we will receive our call and we're on hold then we'll hold because we are probably talking to somebody else. So watch while we're calling and then uh, obviously we'll, ask you a question and hopefully Rajiv ji able to answer something. Don't ask us uh, when you should get married and all of those things. <laughs> Just ask us your immigration question. <laughs> what do you think Rajiv ji? I, uh, I think they can ask you about getting married and getting yeah, of girls course. I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> they should definitely also not call after the, after this, this call is off air. I can uh, don't, don't uh, yeah, call that I can, number. It, uh, and, I can I can switch off the number. I mean, yeah, I know. Yeah, oh, you yeah. you can't switch off, but you still get voicemails, right? Right, 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 right. Oh, but don't yeah, leave yeah, voice. Yeah. <laughs> don't leave voicemails. Nobody's going to answer that. Right. We really we, we wish we could, but we won't have time to do that. Let's yeah. talk during this time that we do have. Yeah. All right. Posting the number. So. Yes. And if we don't get any calls, then um, you'll just answer the chat while we have. This is like an. Ajay, this is the time to. No, let's talk about something. So, <laughs> anyhow, how's work going, Yuri? Work is good. Um, very busy season and it's a budgeting season. So right now is the time when we plan the budget for 2020. Okay, so the number is here. Um, everybody, if you want to call us and talk to us and ask. 
at pinned 530433. Okay, now I'm afraid. Somebody just called. <laughs> All right. Wow. Uh, lots of calls. Hello? Hello? Hi. Yeah, uh, Yudi, hi. Hi, welcome to the Rajiv and Yudi show. <laughs> yeah, before you start talking, okay. let me say, you don't have to tell us who you are. Keep your identity confidential, okay? Yeah. Okay, I can't believe that I was the first, I'm the first person to call you. <laughs> first uh, person ever. Yes. <laughs> we are excited. I'm, I'm excited that this is actually working. What's your question? Yeah, yeah my question is like, my, my fiance and my brother already has B1, B2. So can they travel after 8th of November without any problem? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Okay. No question about it. Okay. Just one thing I, I would recommend is uh, watch the website of the Center for Disease Control, cdc.gov. They'll tell you which, which uh, vaccinations are acceptable in the United States. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, I thought that it, it is a pity of uh, whatever vaccine you take, and uh, until you're fully vaccinated, you should be right. good enough to travel. Uh, I'm not sure about the details yet. I don't think anyone is because the White House looks to the CDC to give them the guidance on what vaccines are going to be acceptable. So I'm hoping that it will be all vaccines in India, but I do not know. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. And one more thing. Uh, thanks, Yuri. Uh, you are doing a really great job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad it, uh, you were able to answer your question. Thanks, man. Talk yeah. to you soon. Bye. Yeah, thank you. You have a good podcast. Yep. Okay, bye. bye. Okay, we have another caller. So, hello. Hello, oh, how's it going? Good. How are you? Okay, good. Are you online? Like, is this going on YouTube? It is on YouTube. Yes. yes. Oh, got it. Uh, well, I got the courage to call you and ask some questions. Uh, so, my question for today is. If I if I get sponsored for a green card from uh, one of my family members, I join the military. Uh, will I be able to expedite my uh, citizenship uh, application? So your your question is: Can you expedite your application if you join the military? Yes. If I, let's say if I get a green card, uh, right. one of my family members sponsored and. I want to, you know, get the nationalization as soon as possible. Uh, will I be able okay. to expedite that process? All right. So this is what you are asking as I see it. There is something called expedited naturalization. Okay. That's available to spouses of U.S. citizens who are being posted abroad for certain purposes to having to do with U.S. government, U.S. defense, etc. So if that's what you're going to ask, or that's what you're asking me about, it is not for all family members. As far as I know, it's only for your spouse, your wife, okay? So Google okay. or whatever search engine you want, uh, expedited naturalization or expeditious naturalization, one of the two. Expeditious naturalization, I think that's what it's called. And you will, you will understand what the basic parameters are. We've done a few of these, okay? Awesome. And that's not that's not only for um, military people, but anybody who is working on government contracts, etc. So you can see the details on that link that comes up from the USCIS.gov website. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Yep. Yep. Bye. Learn from you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Call from Vivek. Hi. Hello. Hey. 
I think you yeah. are also on live. Uh, hi, Yuri. <laughs> hi. Hi. Thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity. So, my question is, and I've been watching your videos, so thank you. Um, thanks a lot. You know, throughout my immigration stay. Okay, let me mute that. <laughs> yeah. So throughout my stay in US, till now, I have been listening to your videos a lot, and it has helped us make our decisions. So really, thank you for that. my question coming to my question is after getting my green card employment based after how many days uh, can i switch my employer so somewhere i read it 180 days just to show my intent is uh, good so is it 180 days from the once the green card is received or 180 days uh, post the filing of i485 okay so If you go to our website immigration.com and look at the frequently asked question this question I've answered no less than 15 times in the last 8 months so you will have a detailed discussion along with follow up questions on what you can and cannot do I'll just give you two quick hints one 180 days is no magic number as long as you had no intention to leave on the date you got your approval things changed even two days later you are okay all right so re- hit up the frequently asked questions on immigration.com perfect awesome. thank you thank you so much sir yep thanks so yeah, much for thank calling yep bye yeah. okay um it's really hard to kind of even focus I'm, i need a third person we need to hire somebody <laughs> to do this <laughs> all right we have another one We have lots. Um. Hello. Oh, one second. Hold on. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Yeah, going good. What's What's uh, your question? So my question is. Uh, yeah. how is the media coverage how important is media coverage for researchers who want to get green card under eb1a it is not the only thing that matters remember you have to meet 3 out of 10 criteria so you've got 10 actually 7 criteria to play with and media coverage is not the only thing there are lots of people who are extraordinary in their fields but nobody has ever heard of them simply because the fields are esoteric very special fields they are not known outside their fields so no media coverage is not a deal breaker don't worry about it i see many folks uh, who have good citation record good publications uh also their media coverage but still their their green card was not approved yeah so how important are, is media coverage there is there are like i said it is a, it isn't important the denials are based upon several different things one is it depends upon the individual judgment of the officer who is deciding your eb1a eb1b national interest waiver type case we had a case last year which was denied i agree that the case was not easy to see you had to actually understand what the specialty was and what the person's exceptional ability was because she was not a hard scientist she was a social scientist so we sued the government when they denied the case and within 2 weeks they gave us the approval what happened in 2 weeks her resume got better no what happened was somebody else looked at the case and said why did you not approve this case okay so that's what happens it is a matter of individual judgment sometimes you have officers who look at different things and sometimes you have officers who are more reasonable in their approach so denials are not an issue because remember you can always refile your case you could get denied 15000 times and file 15000 times there is no bar on how many times you can apply why they deny is purely subjective and sometimes the cases are not that good sometimes i saw a resume yesterday i re- review anywhere from 3 to 10 resumes a day I saw a resume yesterday where somebody had 20 years of experience but there was not even one factor I could point to and say you meet this. I have 30 years of experience I don't think I would qualify. Okay? 
Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yep. You're Thank welcome. you. Thanks for calling. I do feel like radio show now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think people are now understanding that when we are on call, they don't have to call because it's just going to go on to the phone. So, right. All right. We are having another one. Yeah, no? Put that number on speed dial and hit it the moment uh, you see us being off air yep. or off call. Hey. Hi. Hey, Yudi. Thank you so much for doing this. This is super helpful. I have a question for Rajiv Ji. Um, can I go ahead and ask? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Rajiv Ji, what's your guidance for someone who's looking to, you know, book appointments, um, traveling to India for H-1B Dropbox, let's say. When we go to U.S. travel docs right now, pretty much everything, like either they have not opened the dates yet or it's all booked out. So anyone who's looking for a Dropbox appointment, let's say, um, should they even be planning a trip back home or we should just wait for some time before things get yeah. cleared out? Not until you have an appointment. Be- because without an appointment, going there is taking a big chance. I would also recommend mm-hmm. look for consulates in Canada, Mexico, Jamaica, Bahamas, Costa Rica, if any of these countries are taking third country nationals. So they tend to open up okay. a little bit more quickly because the number of applications, especially Costa Rica, Jamaica, and Bahamas tends to be a little bit smaller than Mexico or Canada. So look for don't look for only... India, look also for other countries that might be able to take third country national applications. Theoretically, you can apply for an H-1B visa in any consulate in the world, but you should always double check and make sure they they have enough of a workload uh, availability that they can take your application. If you don't have an appointment, don't go. So it's not risky to go to a different country than your country? No, why should it be? Not any more than... Um, not any more than going to India would be. Okay, cool. Um, thank you so much. That's yep. quite useful. I'll check that out. Good luck. Thanks Good for luck. calling. Thank yep. you. Bye. Okay. Um, yeah, it, I have so many co-workers of mine. They, they've been asking now. They found out that we're doing this. Uh, to ask, uh, can we go for stamping or Dropbox without an have- appointment? Mm-hmm. Well, see, the thing is, there's plenty of information on the internet. You just don't know what you can trust and what you cannot trust. Yeah. yeah. The problem is not of information, but of veracity of information. Mm. Yeah. All right. Hi. Hello? Hello? Hey. Can I can you, hear me. I can hear you. Yes. Can you guys? Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, I have a question for Raju. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. So, is there a law that says that uh, I can go to the India and stay there for X number of days, or I need to be, you know, coming back to the US as soon as I get H one B stamped? Okay. So, I I I think this is a very interesting question. I have a an author page on the Economic Times. So if you Google Economic Times, Rajiv S. Khanna, you will come to my author page. Mm-hmm. I've written an article or a comment on Department of Labor's insistence that if you want to maintain your H-1B, you are allowed to be in India as long as you want. But you have to be paid the American salary according to the H-1B. So if you are getting paid according to the American standards, whatever your promised salary was, there's no doubt you can stay in US, in India <clears throat> as long as you like. Okay. But I point out in that article that this is nonsense. First of all, American laws cannot extend into, the, into India. India is a different country. For example, Normally, when we move people, we have to file an amendment. Am I going to file an amendment to transfer you to, a, to India? That's silly. 
Number two, where do I post notices? How do I post notices according to American law in India? That's also silly. And the third thing is, there is something in law called intermittent H1. So it is perfectly legal for somebody to have an H1B and come and work in the United States only 10 days a year or 15 days a year or 10, 15 times for a few days a year. That's called an intermittent H1B. So therefore, to answer your question, the easiest thing to say is if you're getting paid according to the American standards, you can stay in India as long as you want. If not, talk to your lawyers, discuss these issues. I'm sure they can figure something out. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for calling. So that's interesting. Like, um, so if my boss or like my company says that I'm okay going to India to visit family, but then something happens and I have to stay back for another month or two months and they're still willing to pay me as much money as they were paying, I can totally stay there. Absolutely. No problem at all. Damn. Okay. <clears throat> Couple calls came. <laughs> So used to pressing red button because everybody's calling me. All right, we'll wait for another caller. UD, you're being yeah. very inefficient. You're fired. <laughs> uh, that'll be funny. I mean, it'll be funny. <laughs> it, it, it kind of would be. <laughs> I, I, I resign from my firm at least three times a day because I'm so sick and tired of people pushing me around. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you don't you know. resign that. from work. <laughs> Oh, I resigned from the firm. I won't resign from my work. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, correct. But then they go, that's your name on the on the, on the the uh, uh, nameplate. Yeah. Put somebody else's. I don't want my name up there. <laughs> All right, we so, have another oh. one. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, hi, Yudi. Uh, thanks. Hi, Rajivji. Hello. Hi. Uh, yes, we can. I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and uh... loud and clear. Yep. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, uh, yes, Yudi. Hi. Uh, so I just have a quick question regarding uh, concurrent H one B. So, mm -hmm. uh, like, like the question is, uh, if we are working for a uh, multiple employers for on H one B, so. Uh, is it possible, like, if it is possible, uh, if we work for multiple employers, like, uh, okay, so if you look at the H1B paperwork, it allows you to work on a part time basis, full time basis, or even sliding scale basis. So you could be working 40 hours each week. 10 hours each week, five hours each week, or five to 20 hours each week, or five to 40 hours each week. The law does not require you to be pinned down in terms of full-time only. So the number of hours can be variable. You could have a situation where you are working for one employer 40 hours each week, and another employer 20 hours each week. You can have such concurrent visas. The most interesting example I have is one of our clients many years ago. He had three full-time jobs concurrently and USCIS objected to it saying, how can this guy be working 120 hours each week? And we said he can because he is a super specialized Oracle financials troubleshooter. So all he has to do is once the ERP is set up, the ERP system is set up, just be on call because the corporate database administrators can call him to troubleshoot. And he's on call 40 hours each week for three companies and they're all paying a full-time salary. I hope wow. that answers your question. <laughs> Making a lot of money. Yeah, that sounds he was. Um, And he I deserved it. He was very rich. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. So okay. one more question, like let us say, for example, uh, if my H1B has picked up in, a, uh, in upcoming March, so uh, will I be? It, it will be depending upon myself for uh, for making uh, my H one B active in the next year, or uh, uh, should I like uh, go into the administrative process and complete all those uh, documentation and uh, 
uh, start working on H1B on this October itself? Um, that question is not clear. Ask me again. I don't understand what you're asking. Ask me again. H1B has picked up uh, this year, uh, sure. like uh, upcoming year, I'm sorry, obviously, like in the, mm -hmm. in the month of March. So mm -hmm. uh, if it is picked up in the March, so I need to go through the documentation process for it to be approved, right? So for example, mm -hmm. uh, like I, I, I don't want to go in that year. I want to make my H1B uh, pick, uh, like H1B. Uh, he basically wants to use okay. his OPT. Yeah, no, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yes. So let me, you know, this is this is an art. Asking a question is an art. I don't know if you realize this. I don't mind if I look like I'm talking down to you, but I had to learn it the hard way. The question is, if I'm selected in lottery for the in one year, can I carry that selection into the next year instead of applying in the first year? The answer is no. <laughs> That's your question, okay? So, so yeah. he doesn't have a choice that he like he has no. OPT available it's for that year only. You can't carry that selection into the next year. Oh, okay. And if he doesn't, then he has to do selection again in the next again. year. Again. Yeah. All right. Cool. Hope we were able to answer your question. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Well, yep. Good luck. Yep. Yeah, I have to tell you this story. So yeah. first time I was sent in the Supreme Court of India to present a case, the judges were so annoyed with me because I just didn't know how to frame a point, even though I knew what I wanted to say, but I had I used too many words and not enough information. Mm. And that's a common problem. So right. what we have to do is when you speak, revisit what you're saying, make sure that you can shorten it and make sure that you can shorten it according to the audience that's listening. So people are experts. They know the law. You don't have to go through the whole law. Just yeah, yeah. to the point. So it took me about six months of a lot of yelling from a lot of judges before I got it. Yeah. You have a call from India, so I'm excited to see. Why? You don't have people in India? <laughs> well, it's international calling from there, no? Oh, there's 1.3 billion of us. Somebody wants to talk to us. Hi. Hi, Yudi. I'm speaking from India. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, can I apply for a green card without being on an H1B? Yes, you can. Happens all the time. Oh, by the way, again, go to the Economic Times. I have an author page, Rajiv S. Khanna, the Economic Times, where we talked about somebody going from F1 directly to green card. So you can even be outside the United States and still get your green card. We've done a bunch of cases for professors, physicians, uh, not, not physicians as in uh, practicing for the researchers. So researchers, professors uh, who got EB1As done while they were still outside the United States. Okay. Did we answer your question? Yeah, thank you, sir. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Good luck. Thank you, awesome, thank you. Thanks for calling. Yeah, I, I mentioned someone calling from India. It's because uh, it's international calling. I mean, it's expensive for them, I think. Call. Do you know how much I charge per hour? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. Sorry. We, are, we, are, we are giving away a lot of our time and only happy to do it because that life is, is not about money. You are so sweet. Yes, yes, okay. Life is about value, not money. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Hello? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nice going, Yudi. Hi. Yudi, this is Omkar. Do you remember me? I do, but I didn't want it to you to reveal your identity. But yeah, so, anyway, what's... Okay, all right, that's totally fine. Uh, so I had a quick question. There. Um, so, sir, I have a question that I got my H1B approved last year. And um, I am planning to get it stamped, but unfortunately, I'm not able to travel to India and not get an appointment very soon. So my mm -hmm. question was, um, I found an appointment, like just two-day waiting in Mexico. 
what do you think about it? Is it like safe to go there and get it done? Yeah. Do you think I will have any immigration issue? Yeah, just make sure that the consulate is open to processing cases from third country nationals. They must be because you don't obviously don't have a Mexican address. Obviously, you are going there coming from the USA. But if there's a way for you to contact the consulate, email them, call them, double check that. But yeah, Mexico is as good as any other place, I guess. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That's all I had. Yeah, You're thanks. very welcome. Thanks By the way, calling. before before you hang up, another advantage of Mexico, Canada, and New Virgin Islands is that they are called contiguous territories. So they are land connected with the United States. It is the law okay. that you can travel to a contiguous territory and return. This is just for your information, not, not in this case, mm -hmm. but for everybody to understand. If you travel to a contiguous territory and do not apply for a visa, you can come back within 30 days without a visa. So USA allows you to travel outside. Okay. In your case, if you allow for a, apply for a visa, and get stuck, you'll have to stay there until the visa issue is resolved, or you'll have to fly to India from there and wait there. You can always reapply. But I would definitely apply in Mexico. I don't see why not. Make sure that your case has no red flags for consular processing. Talk to your lawyers before you go. Got it. I'll do that. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, Yudi. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks. Goodbye. Thanks for calling. Bye. Yeah, there are, I mean, of course, some friends of mine will call, uh, but like you said, I don't. I have a question, Yudi. Yeah. You have friends? <laughs> Some, maybe like one or two. They have met you? No, actually, they haven't. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. International from Germany. Germany is good. We like Germany. Right. <laughs> Hello? They hang up. Oh. <clears throat> All right. So wait for another call. So uh, some people are saying they don't have. Uh, well, they can just type. I mean, we can do a mix and match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We can. So the question is I 140 and I 140 485 concurrent and non current, non concurrent filing pros and cons. Um, only one con, you lose money if you get I-140 denied. If you are like me, don't believe so much in money as in value, apply concurrently. Hmm. Only difference between the two is loss of money. What is the big deal? So you lose, you lose. Make some more. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Easy peasy. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hi, Judy. Uh, this is uh, Shyam. Um, and uh, hello, uh, Rajiv, sir. Uh, Hi, sir. I would like to ask one question. Uh, actually, um, I uh, started my PhD in computer science um, from this uh, fall session. And my question is that about uh, O1 status, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. O1 uh, visa. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to uh, found a startup in mm -hmm. the next uh, four or five years. And mm -hmm. uh, how it can affect my O1 visa? Yeah, it's not. It's not the most comfortable. Yeah, it's not the most comfortable fit. Okay, I think we can try, but it's not the most comfortable fit. There is there is something called uh, entrepreneurial parole. Even that is not a great visa for these uh, situations. There is keen sensitivity in Congress that we need better visa options for entrepreneurs. So far, we have no good options except I would suggest some kind of a situation, and this we have done, where you are stockholder in your own company and you have a board of directors who can fire you, we can then make an H-1B case for you. So you can start your entrepreneurial bid during your OPT, where you are allowed to do anything you want. Hopefully, within that time, you have a guy who can be your supervisor. Don't make things up, in fact. 
And the supervisor can then help you get your STEM OPT. After the STEM OPT and while the STEM OPT, each year you can also be trying for your H1B. So it's possible. It is an uncomfortable bed to lie in, but it is definitely better than the O1 bed. So hopefully by the time you graduate, we'll have a lot many more options. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks for calling. Or did he go to start his op venture already? He did not say. I mean, I hung up. <clears throat> okay. um, there was a good question. Uh, my wife is on H4 visa. She has masters already. Getting opportunity from your Euro European, European country. European. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can she take up such opportunities staying in United States? So I always said that I'm a little uncomfortable with this. If you are working on U.S. soil. I don't know how far the government thinks that's okay. We've never received a definitive guidance from the government on this issue. There's a split amongst the lawyers. Some lawyers, my colleagues think that if you are working on an endeavor that has zero connection with the United States, no money comes through or from United States, no clients in United States, you probably are okay working for a foreign company or a foreign endeavor on the US soil. But people like me, we are more conservative, think that's not okay. But let's go from the bottom up, okay? Let's say, what if you do work? And what if USCI says, oh, no, 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 that's wrong. What does that, one? what happens then? You go outside USA, get an H4 visa and come back in. That's all that happens. You, as long as you don't lie about it, even that, if it is considered to be a violation of status, it is a fixable problem. Okay. Hi, are you on call? Hello? Can you hear us? I think you're speaking very softly. Someone who applies for the EV lottery, will it, uh, will the chances of getting H1B or being part in future? Okay, so let me let me stop you right there. My knowledge of DV lottery is next to zero. We don't do any DV lottery cases, but here is the good news: DV lottery has zero relationship with other green card categories as well as H1Bs. So it will have absolutely no effect on those two. That much I know as to how does it affect your tourist visa chances, F1 chances, student visa chances. I don't know that question, that answer. But for H1B and other green card categories, the fact that you applied for DV and failed has zero problem, okay? Thanks for calling. Yeah, I think there's something wrong with their uh, system. We could barely hear him. Yeah, or... Okay. Uh... Maybe he was calling from India. I have that effect on people. <laughs> uh, right. Waiting for another call. So I'm currently utilizing my CPT approved by my university, but the course doesn't require a CPT. In the meantime, my H1B application is picked up and filed. Yeah. Received an RFP on CPT. Yeah, they're going to make you go outside USA for H-1B visa stamping. So if the CPT is not required, then um, if you did a day one CPT, of course, if you did a different kind of CPT, I do not know. But typically, what is the worst case scenario? You go outside for an H-1B visa stamping. That should fix it. As long as you don't misrepresent anything, you should be fine. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. I like, I, I was waiting for this to say, we have another caller. <laughs> <laughs> we can do mix and match. I think that's an easier way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just have to get used to this thing. Or hire a person. I'm not applying. I can tell you that. <laughs> Hi. Hello? Hi. Yeah. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear Hi. you. Yeah, so actually I have a question uh, for you guys. Uh, 
my H1B is approved and I booked a visa slot for uh, camping this year. And then I got an offer recently for another employer and they are applying for H1B transfer. So my question is that can I use the same visa slot with a new employer uh, or what happens to my scheduled visa interview if I decided to pursue and start my job with new employer? My best guess is that you should be able to use it as long as you have the approval. And just to be sure about this, contact the U.S. consulate so that you have a definitive answer. And they usually do answer questions. Not satisfactorily sometimes, but usually they do answer questions. So in my view, you should be able to use it. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, Good thank luck. you for calling. Okay. <clears throat> um, next one. Visa is booked, done, slash done, and later get, get an admit from a dream university. What can we do? So like they got a visa on one university, but then later got an admit from other university they were waiting for. What should they do? Uh, the same thing what I suggested to the other gentleman, you let the consulate know that I'm getting an admission in another university. I'll be walking in with a different I-20 than I had I had requested. What do I have to do? They should be able to accommodate you. Okay. So but I, I haven't you read this. Yeah. yeah. You don't have, you have to change anything before coming or can you? But after one That's what I, the counselor should be able to tell him what the procedure is. Yeah. <coughs> All right, this one is interesting. Let's answer this. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Hi, Yudi. Hi, Rajuji. How are you? Yeah. Hello. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. I am on H-1B right now, and uh, I am opting for H-1B transfer. And I'd like to know that, will my current employer know that I have opted for H-1B transfer? And no. is there something which I need to take care of no. before opting for H-1B transfer? No, they do not know, unless for some reason you do not join the transferred job. In that case, when you apply next time for an amendment or an extension, the employer will know that you had applied earlier okay. for something else. So if you are, if you ju jump ships, the existing employer does not know. They have no way of knowing. Perfect. All right. Good awesome. luck. Thanks for calling. Thank yep. Thank you. Yeah, you were you were right that doing this is going to answer less questions, but it'll be more interactive. We're testing out the waters. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. We can always we can always go back to the old system. Yeah. Next uh, is from uh, Shulika saying my daughter is. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna take that question. My daughter is planning for masters on F1 in fall 2022. Can we parents do apply F1B2 stating purpose as a company for her admission, etc. You can, it depends if the if the daughter is still a child, which we consider to be somebody who's 10, 12, 14 years old, maybe. But if the daughter is 21 or over 18 or 18, even 18, it might be more difficult to make a case that they still still need their mom or their dad because the way U.S. parenting and Indian parenting is approached is completely different. So you can try. There is no harm in trying as long as you're completely truthful. I know parents who have been able to stay a year, two years on a B1, B2 visa with their children, but they were children who were going to, to grade school or high school. I mean, they, they don't necessarily have to apply for reason i mean like giving that as a reason they should whatever the truth is if they don't that's fraud 
Fraud is permanent bar from entering the United States. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear us? Hi. Um, good afternoon, Yuri, and good afternoon, Rajiv, sir. Hi. Good morning to me. <laughs> good, good afternoon. afternoon. I'm guessing you're calling from you. uh, East Coast. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you for the answer you just gave me about CP. Uh, required, not required, but for so I have to. Worst case is I have to go out of the country. Yeah. But um, question I have is, where should I drop it? Go for the interview, uh, or no? Do I just no, no. You could continue. Interview? See, that's something your lawyer should answer. They should review and make sure it's not a violation of status. Merely, it's a it's a problem from the U.S. Uh, immigration conversion to H-1B perspective. Just double check that because after all, you got the CPT, the school has authorized it. There must be a reason for it. Was it a day one CPT? No, sir. Um, I got my CPT after a semester. After one semester. And yeah, okay, so so this could be a different kind of a CPT. You have You have not... So you got it after one semester. Are you in a graduate program? Yes, sir, master's. Master's degree. So you got your, after one semester, I think it requires, I don't remember the rules Nine for CPC. I, yeah, I think it's two full semesters, whatever that is, whether it is nine months or 10 months. I don't remember exactly what it is. I wouldn't want to, conjecture on the rules because there are so many variations in these cases. So right. there is only there are only two things possible. Either there is some violation of the regulations, which I doubt, because otherwise the school would not be issuing you the CPT. But let's assume there is a violation and it has happened inadvertently, unknowingly. They might, USCIS might forgive it. And if you have not broken the law and you continue to follow something that's legal, I don't think that's a problem. But if it is a violation of status of some kind, your lawyers tell you that's what it is, then you should stop and get the H-1B visa stamping. Uh, although even unauthorized employment is not a ground for denial of an H-1B. Right. I mean, um, there's a, a gray line, I would say, because uh, when I asked the university, they said the course does not require, but this is part of the study. That's how yeah. they've given the letter. They so, must have, they must have their, I think it's one of those um, rules for pre-completion, a, pre, a CPT for um, for subsequent as, a, as, comp as compared to day one CPTs are different. So I do not know exactly what your situation is. Um, but worst case scenario is you have to go for a visa stamping. Your question, should I quit working, depends upon how badly you're breaking the law. And even if you are, why can't you continue? It has been validly given by the school until it is revoked. Why should you not continue? That's the way I see it. Okay. Okay. Good luck. Right. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Okay. So I think it's 1020. We'll take one more call or question and call it off. Okay. Yuri um, has a new toy in case you guys haven't noticed. Yes. So. Um, I haven't made the video. I, I'm supposed to edit it, but yeah, that's the toy. He's pleased as a dog with two tails. <laughs> All right. We have another yeah. caller. So. Please call, guys. He wants you to call. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, so, Rajiv ji, uh, hi, hi, Yuri, hi, Rajiv. So, my question is, if I use cross that uh, cross country eligibility and and get my green card uh, and if I get a divorce, what would be? No problem. No problem. From immigration law perspective, once you get cross chargeability and you get your green card, that's the end of the story. But just, um, I hope you're not doing it just to get a green card. But if you are 
if you're not doing that, subsequent divorce after getting a green card is no problem in a genuine marriage. Okay? But if the marriage is not genuine, I think there is a case to be made there for fraud and misrepresentation. Okay. All right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for calling. So, uh, good question on, on follow-up on that. So, let's say if he did get divorced, green card was for 10 years, and he did not uh, got uh, so he got divorced. Uh, does he have, when he applies for extension on his green card, what happens at that point of time? See, extension of the green card is an administrative process. It's like extension of your driver's license. You fill some forms and you get it. Okay. The they problem don't occurs any kind during of verification on that. No, naturalization. When you apply for naturalization, then they open the whole box and they want to look at everything that you did in the past. And I don't think cross-chargeability has ever been an issue uh, in any of the naturalization proceedings. I've been doing it for 30 years. And we get very difficult cases, not just routine cases. We get plenty of routine cases, but we also get cases that are extremely difficult. And I'm yet to run into a case where cross-chargeability was questioned. Okay, one last question and then call it. You're the boss. Hi. Hello? Uh, hello, is it easy? Yeah, it's me. Oh. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So, I recently got an ad uh, visa, a phone visa. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, uh, I got a better offer from another university. So, uh, so I want to know if I can change the university now or uh, like I asked my local embassy and they told me that I have to appear for a new visa interview so in this current uh, time like yeah. uh, lack of schedules I'm afraid that I may not get enough time so what is the uh, what is the well, better option for me can I change it after going to the US is there any problem mm -hmm. related to that yeah look into like, that yeah, look into that because transferring schools is not difficult. If if you come into the United States, take up studies, and then you transfer schools, I think you are okay. What I would do if I were you, I would double check with the DSO of the school where you are transferring. Okay? These guys are the experts. They'll tell you what it takes. Actually, service transfers are not that difficult, but visa transfers are a pain. So therefore, if you come with the intention to start school and then transfer, I don't think that's a problem. But I haven't researched this issue. This is just off the top of my head advice. I don't know for sure, but I think that's how it should be. Double check with the DSO, they are the experts. Like I checked with them and they recommended that I should uh, come, within, uh, come with them. July 20, but okay. to do that, I have to appear for a new visa interview. So, okay. So I would, uh, but because... Tell me that if I want to change, that can... Yeah. Please okay. go ahead. You could always go after one semester. Nobody can stop you. No? I can change from one, after one semester? Yeah, why yeah. not? That's, that's done I all the time. Think that. Yeah, absolutely. That I know for sure is not a problem. So let me ask you this. Uh, write down the name of the website I'm going to give you. It is DHS dot, one word, study in the states. DHS dot, study in the states dot gov. You might find good tips there. This is a site run by okay. the US government for students. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. I think he was from Bangladesh. I mean, at least that's what it said on my phone. 
anyway i think that's it um good how how did you like it rajiv ji yeah i think i think it was good um, yeah and there are some I things think, which can make it no I, i personally thought you did very well um it was efficient we were still able to and it's it's nice to have a little change yeah little mix and match why yeah. not Okay thanks everybody don't call me now we are going <laughs> to end, <laughs> end the session so if you want to talk uh, uh join next next thursday and uh, talk to you soon thanks rajiv ji sorry bye bye everyone see you guys